Good morning, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, a board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Wade Health. Today, we're talking about depression and genetics in a little more detail. We talked about it last week, and we're going deeper today. So, good morning, Kathy, who's joining us. Good morning, everyone. And so, in discussing this topic last week, we went into how some people will just feel like they've had depression or they've had anxiety most of their lives. They may or may not have had trauma. And last week we really discussed how genetics can interplay with traumatic life experiences or not. And where maybe somebody more just has a genetic profile that can predispose them to something like depression. Now depression is clearly very complicated. It's multifactorial, but we're trying to go through all those factors. And so right now we're talking about genetics. So anything you wanted to start off with, Kathy, before we got going? I think we just really need to, I mean, I'm sure when people talk or they get into an argument, you've heard them say, oh, your whole family's nuts. Right, right, exactly. Uh, in some cases, it, there is that genetic disposition and there mm -hmm. are gene mutations that kind of lead to that. So why don't we get started with the MTHFR specifically and how it affects the brain health and neurotransmitters. Okay, sounds good. So we hear MTHFR now these days, we have some familiarity with it. And as Kathy and I were discussing, we we're saying, well, do people really know what MTHFR is? What does it really do? How does having a genetic polymorphism for MTHFR really affect how the brain works and chemistry and things like that? So here's a molecule, it's called 510-methylene tetrahydrofolate. Now, you see the last F is folate. Folate is vitamin B9. We've all heard you need good vitamin B9, particularly if you're pregnant, make sure you get the B vitamins, all of that. Well, this is one of the precursors to active folic acid. So the MTHFR, which is here in red, converts 5,10-methylene tetrahydrofolate into 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Within the world of biochemistry, methylation, as you'll hear it referred to, is really important. So methylation is used when we're, uh, it affects our DNA, it affects a number of processes to really keep it, inflammation down, and you'll see that right here. So 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate gets converted into tetrahydrofolate. Now in that conversion, the methyl group is donated to homocysteine. So many of you have heard of homocysteine, your doctors may have tested you for homocysteine, if you've heard of MTHFR being related to vascular disorders, that's one route in which it can affect it. So homocysteine is inflammatory. And we actually see in depression, particularly bipolar, as well as schizophrenia, all these diseases of the brain, if we want to say it that way, have a component lots of times of high homocysteine. Definitely with bipolar and schizophrenia and sometimes with depression. And when it links up with depression, it links up with this MTHFR issue. So you need this 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate from methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, that's MTHFR, to convert the homocysteine into methionine. The methionine gets cycled into s methionine. Many of you have heard of that, SAM-E. And SAM-E is frequently used in nutraceutical combinations. It's used in natural formulas to help people feel better and make more neurotransmitters. Also know that SAM-E binds to one other end of the MTHFR enzyme and helps it to work better and it can actually affect its regulation, so to speak. Does, and Kathy, I'm diagramming all this out on the board. Any questions thus far? Mm, no, I don't think so. I, um, I no, just go ahead with what just you're doing on the board. Okay. So this is how we get rid of homocysteine, which is inflammatory. Now also, MTHFR is super important because it helps us to make this 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate that we need to have for appropriate uh, tetrahydrobiopterin levels, and BH4 helps us to have appropriate tyrosine hydroxylase and tryptophan hydroxylase. These are enzymes that help us make dopamine and serotonin. So this is the exact pathway as to how MTHFR really affects our serotonin and dopamine levels as well as our brain inflammation. So it's being thrown around so much out there that you need to take active B9 and you know you got to pay attention to your MTHFR status, but for those of you who want a little more detail, this is really the biology of what's going on. 
So the point being, if you have an MTHFR polymorphism, and there are two main ones, so there's a 1298, 1298C, which is more for detoxification, and there's a C677T, which is more related to brain health. Now, if you are homozygous for an abnormality, meaning you have both copies of the MTHFR gene being abnormal, then this enzyme will function at about 25%. Whereas if you're homozygous for the 1298C, so let me say it again. If you're homozygous for MTHFR C677T, this enzyme functions at about 25%. If you're homozygous for 1298C, then you're somewhere, I think, like in the 80 or 70%. So the point being is, is if you're homozygous for the C677T, it can really affect how that enzyme functions, and it can really affect how you get rid of homocysteine, and how you make dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Okay, thoughts, Kathy? Is there anything in our genes that dictates which one of those? You know, I know there's some other variations, but these are the main two. Mm -hmm. uh, what dictates, because I've had testing done on different family members, mm -hmm. and different family members have different... Um, Numbers. So, right. how, how, I mean, is that just uh, luck of the draw? Kind of, yeah. I'd have to go back and look if it's autosomal dominant or recessive for the inheritance patterns. And those can get kind of complicated. But, yeah, it's not always one okay. to one. Yeah. So, what you've drawn out there is pretty much a really good case of what chemical imbalance can be in this case. Mm hmm. Exactly. This is okay. specifically how MTHFR affects the quote unquote chemical imbalance. And with MTHFR, what we find, one of the, the main characteristics is when the brain is under stress and it's unbalanced like that, doesn't have the B9 and so forth, that what, it kind of shuts down, quits working for people? Yeah, so in essence then when you have less serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, then you're more at risk to be susceptible to stressors. In essence, that's what they found. And I cited a study last week, and I, I think this drawing is from Translational uh, Psychiatry 2018. I can get anybody the link that wants it. But we went through another article last week where they looked at people who had depression and when would they relapse. And basically, if you have an MTHFR polymorphism and a history of trauma, you're going to relapse at around 166 days on average, whereas if you don't have an MTHFR polymorphism, and you don't have a history of traumatic events, it's more on the order of like 800 days between the probability of you relapsing. So MTHFR basically makes us more susceptible to those stress, stressful events. Okay, yeah. so from what I've seen in my own life and what I've dealt with, I would just encourage parents especially mm -hmm. uh, to kind of be cognizant of what's going on with their kids because whether you know it or not, if you, if you don't know that you have this and you have a child who struggles in school, um, I've seen this with tons of people and I've looked at it back generationally. And uh, the thing I hate about it is, is that at that time there wasn't anything to be done about it. Now that we know it exists, yeah, there's an easy supplement to take and you, right. you take your regimen and you're good. Mm -hmm. But having had this when I was a teenager and someone who did well in school, but coming up, say, one class that, um, I don't know, just like, you know, when you say mental block, that mental mm -hmm. block was there. I right. didn't know the mental block was MTA right. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh -huh. and, and couldn't do anything about it other than get very, very, very frustrated and probably more depressed. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I would also say this, my depression didn't feel like depression. My depression was usually in a rage kind uh -huh. of thing. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And we both know that I have the, the C677T, mm -hmm. which is the stronger, which now I know since you've talked about this, that I take a lot stronger dose than what you recommended for my husband, who has the 1298C. Mm -hmm. So now that we've talked about it today, and I know how much difference that makes in the numbers of the percentage of activation, then I know why mm -hmm. I'm taking the stronger dose. Um, right. You used the term disease a while ago, and you hesitated at disease because you know I hate that. Right, right. <laughs> um, abnorm is abnormality better? I mean, it's uh, to me. I don't think I, I hate the label that people have mental illness. It's not an illness. I mean, it's I'm not going to get over it like a fever. 
So to me, it's it's an abnormality that I deal with no different than uh, what one of my legs is like a quarter of inch shorter than the other. Right, right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so right. I think that's, that's the way we need to look at that. Mm -hmm. And parents, if you see this in your kids, I urge you to sit down and just take 20 minutes by yourself and sit and think back of your childhood and maybe some things that you went through right. that you didn't do, deal with so well. Right. Maybe this would give us the indication, okay, maybe we should have some testing and see if we're dealing with this. And if we are, I'm sorry, I feel like I got shortchanged as a kid because I didn't know it was there. Right, um, always. And, um, yeah. you know, something we could help our children with, but at the same time help that parent I mean, nothing nothing harder than being a parent mm -hmm. and wanting your kids to do well and thinking you just need to be stricter or help them more or push them more. And I'm here to tell you, folks, you can push until the cows come home. It ain't going to help. Right. <laughs> uh, once your brain is shut down True. and that True. poor kid is, is yeah. in that almost a vortex of... Right. I know, I know, I know I can do this. I know I can do this. And that's like a spinning kind of thing. And you just, you can't do it. Um, even if you meditated or did whatever, mm -hmm. I don't think it would make any difference because the chemical uh, balance just mm -hmm. isn't there to take you through to the other side. So, I, again, mm -hmm. I just really, really, really recommend you take a long, hard look at your life, how you grew up difficulties you might have experienced and see if maybe those kids aren't having that same sort of thing and if so then maybe we could get them a little bit of assistance and I'm not going to say help I'm going to say assistance right. because it, it's just something to help them get over those hurdles and it's to put them back in balance and that's I mean that's what you do Dr. Gates you mm -hmm. people their brain right. their gut right. their whatever you put us back mm -hmm. in balance so that we perform at our optimum and that's what we all want exactly and we even had a question when you were talking there, Kathy, based on what you were saying, stronger dose of what? And Kathy's referring to basically methyl tetrahydrofolate. So for people who have this MTHFR polymorphism, basically you can circumvent that polymorphism by taking methyl tetrahydrofolate, the active form of it. And so you can get a stronger dose of that. And then that stronger dose will help you to then make the serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. But so, we yeah. do have to have the testing so that we know which True. version True. of the MKHFR mutation that you have so mm -hmm. that you get the right dosage. Right. Um, you and I both know like a psychi mm -hmm. um, psychiatric guy there in, in Reno who's who's definitely in the know about all of this. Right. And he's one version. His son's another. Uh, like mm -hmm. I said, my husband's one. I'm another. My grandson, who has, is really my step-grandson, we have uh -huh. the same one. <laughs> It's, gotcha, it's really gotcha. weird at the draw right. of the cards that you get. Right. But this is this is a very, I think that's something else we forgot to mention. This is something where almost 50% of the population deals with this, isn't it? Yeah, between 1298 and C677T, absolutely, yeah. It's a really common. It's super, super common. Super yeah. common, but very aggravating. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It can have a variety of manifestations. <laughs> So, uh, again, I, everybody, there is help for it if you have anything like we've talked about mm -hmm. or you've dealt with any of these things. Right. OCD is a big part of it as well. You you really want to be a perfectionist. Your your clothes have to be all one way in the closet. You can't go past a crooked picture without straightening it, and I do right. it in doctor's offices all the time. <laughs> People right. look at me. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it's just part of the deal. And uh, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't say it enough that there it's such a simple answer just to get the correct um the mthfr medicine is just such an, an improvement in in my life mm -hmm. how much it's changed mm -hmm. my being able to handle lots of stuff i mean right. i i'm not mad all the time i don't take everything personally i right. um i've been able to function I I'm not going to say like a normal person okay. <laughs> because we don't know what normal is. I've been right. been able to function to where I feel happier, better. There you go. Strong, stronger. There you go. Exactly. Uh, more in control as uh -huh. well. I think would be another good term. So uh, it, that's one. That's just one little piece of the pie of this brain and depression and whatever. So we need you to tell us about um, how COMT affects brain structure. Yeah, and you know, and just finishing on what you said there, Kathy, and that's the big thing. And so, again, these things are multifactorial. If you have depression, talking to a psychologist can be extremely powerful because we need coping strategies. 
coping strategies. We need support systems for our stressors. Uh, you know, other modalities, hypnotherapy, in the with the right person, I have found to be so incredibly powerful. Uh, dealing with those traumas and things of that nature, but it it never ceases to amaze me how the biology can affect, like Kathy is saying, how stress impacts us, how our mood is affected, how you know we our energy levels are produced, how we handle anger, all those factors because our brain makes these neurotransmitters, and I think it's lost that a lot of people. You know, we see these pharmaceutical commercials all the time saying you need to take this medication so you can run in the field and be happy. Well, those medications basically are keeping more of these chemicals between your neurons. They're not necessarily helping your brain to make more of these chemicals. And it's all throughout the literature that if you have an MTHFR polymorphism, you're not going to make these chemicals correctly. This enzyme will be at 25%, so you'll have 25% of the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate to make serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine through BH4 production. So hopefully that kind of drives it home, and that's just one small piece of the pie, is Kathy is saying. So what's another piece of the pie? You hear us talk about it all the time, the fear center versus the memory area. To be redundant, basically, your memory area, and I think that's showing up, your memory area right here, you produce about 700 new brain cells a day in this area. The fear center is our stress center. Now, the memory area, these little neurons, which we think of like little seedlings in the garden, are fueled by serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So a lack of these chemicals produces a lack of neurogenesis, or a probability of a lack of neurogenesis in that part of your brain. And that's where Kathy is saying she wished she understood as a, you know, as a teenager what was going on because if somebody is not making enough of this, they're not going to make enough neurogenesis here, what happens? The fear center starts to enlarge, it gets bigger. As the fear center enlarges and it connects more hormonal signals to the adrenal glands, which makes more cortisol, which fries more brain cells really throughout the brain, but particularly in the temporal lobes in the memory area. So we have that. We have this structural gray matter imbalance. Now COMT stands for catechol methyl transferase. So just as these chemicals are produced, they also have to be broken down into building blocks, recycled, put back into the neurons so they can be serotonin and norepinephrine and dopamine again. Now COMT degrades dopamine and norepinephrine. So if somebody has a COMT polymorphism where they do not break down these chemicals as well, then if it's a guy, he's going to have a proclivity definitively, it seems like in the literature, based on the consensus studies, to have more anxiety. If it's a girl, it can go either way. Now, if you basically break down these chemicals too fast, this is called the valval polymorphism of COMT, then you're not going to have enough dopamine and norepinephrine. This can lead a female to feeling anxious. Why? Because in a female's brain, the prefrontal cortex is more dependent on dopamine and estrogen balances. And so for them, if they don't have enough dopamine, that can actually lead to a decrease in prefrontal activation and an increase in anxiety. By the same token, a new study came out where they showed that the memory area on the right-hand side specifically for people who have this UMT polymorphism where they break down dopamine and norepinephrine too quickly will actually be smaller. And there's even research coming out showing that if your valval for CMT, meaning you break it down excessively, uh, one side of your hippocampus can be smaller, and if you're met-met, the other side of the amygdala will be bigger. It's very, very interesting, the right and left sided relationships we're learning. But basically what you need to know is that if you have the COMT polymorphism where you break it down too much, then your memory center is gonna be, or have a probability if you're depressed to be smaller on the right hand side. So that's really important information, why? Because there are certain substances, natural, that may be able to affect how your brain makes dopamine. If you have an MTHFR polymorphism on top of that, then you're gonna have less of these chemicals also. So that's really, really important to attend to. So Kathy, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. Uh, 
big light bulb went off over my head as you were talking about all of that because I've asked this question, I asked it of you, and I've asked it of several other professionals, and I got the same answer a lot. And I've mentioned to you that you mentioned the thing of men having this and having more anxiety. So if they have the MTHFR and the COMT thing going right. on, I'm thinking maybe this is what goes on with the male members in my family. I've told you oh, that. Okay, all yeah. my, my nephews, my sons, right. all these people have so much trouble testing and different things with stress. Mm -hmm. um, terrible grades. Just always, always, always struggle with this stuff where all my nieces and, and my uh, granddaughters mm. and all these people mm. do great. <laughs> you know, they're all straight-A students. Right. They all have master's degrees. They do all these things so much better than the men do. Oh, that's interesting. And, and I'm, I'm swear, uh, these poor boys, when I watch them, you can just – I've actually had them – I've looked into their eyes, and you can just see the confusion. Mm -hmm. Because they really don't know where they're at or mm -hmm. what's going on. And it does cause a ton of anxiety. And then I do feel like depression follows because they feel like no matter how hard they try, they can't perform at the level that people want them to perform at. And it does have to do more. It seems like they're great at sports, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> they can pitch, right. they can hit, they can play football, basketball, whatever. Right, That's great. Right. Uh, but when it comes to studying... Uh -huh. And that and that structure and testing. I mean, they test awful. Um, okay. I, I I think there has to be a correlation between these two. Now that you brought this up. Right. And I'm drawing on the whiteboard as you say that because that illustrates perfectly what we call the U-shaped curve of dopamine and norepinephrine. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. My writing is horrible. Let me try and rewrite this. So anybody who wants to go back and watch this looks halfway intelligible. In essence, it's, as I said last week, it's like Goldilocks and the oatmeal. We don't want the oatmeal too cold. We don't want it too hot. We want it just right. So you want just the right amount of dopamine because the right amount of dopamine is going to help your brain to function ideally. If you have too much dopamine or norepinephrine, you're going to have a probability of having anxiety. So as Kathy is saying with the males in the family, and this is what the studies are showing, males who are what is referred to as met-met, for COMT, they have a probability of being over here. So they may actually do well when they're under no pressure. That's when their brain's gonna function well and they have the probability actually of having increased cognition and increased cognitive flexibility and being able to think of a lot of things at once. But when they're under stress, you would think of them as crashing, they have too much dopamine, too much norepinephrine, it leads to way too much anxiety and they have a hard time functioning. Whereas, okay, uh -huh. that, that goes with what I'm saying, and I mentioned exactly. to you earlier, if they're playing sports and they can memorize all the plays in a playbook, mm -hmm. something, some place where they don't feel stressed, that they feel comfortable, right. then they're functioning well. Right. But when it comes to an algebra exam, <laughs> right. uh -huh. yeah. um, no, they're, they're going to maybe squeak by by the skin of their teeth or they're mm -hmm. going to flunk it. That's just the way it is. 100%. Exactly. Whereas with females, it's a little different based on what I said regarding the estrogen and the dopamine levels. So because estrogen changes the way prefrontal pathways are wired for dopamine, when a female has more dopamine, she may have more anxiety, but she actually has a probability of actually having really increased cognition. So as Kathy is saying, that then in these circumstances, they're under stress, it's like, wow, they come alive, they're really good. I'm not seeing females who are met-met can't have anxiety, they can't. But it's really interesting that females who are val val who are down here when they have less dopamine that's actually when a lot of them will have anxiety and this has been a big game changer for me clinically using natural supplements i would say in the last year and a half basically where a lot of women where i would have said okay you have anxiety we more need to approach this from a serotonin perspective in reality they needed more dopamine they needed more nor norepinephrine and if you're not interested in natural supplements, you know somebody who's more interested in medications, this is also super important because there's now genetic tests that we're doing and other psychiatrists are doing where they can say, oh, okay, based on your genetics and how your liver processes these medications, it can really affect, we can actually with more certainty say, you're gonna to respond to this medication or that medication. At Gateswood Health, we're using the same information for natural substances. So any thoughts on that, Kathy? Um, uh 
I kind of, when we talk natural, then I go back to what we talked about a few weeks ago with the uh, schizophrenic patient Mm -hmm. and the fact that, you know, I, I, I referenced like, uh, the TV shows where the cops are always, you know, hassling the, the guy that lives on the street that has schizophrenia or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's always out there on the street or he's not, not functioning because he's not taking his meds because what's their answer? Usually they say, I can't take those. Mm-hmm. They, they, they make me feel like I'm dead. Right. Uh, I, I'm not me. I don't like them. I don't right. want to take them. And kind of what you said a while ago about some of those medications, they don't, you know, they, they shut it down. They don't keep things working. Uh, the way they should. Mm-hmm. So if anybody can get by with natural supplementation, it's definitely the way to go to, to continue being yourself much more so. And as I told you when I first started on my MTHFR stuff, was like, okay, um, no, I don't feel like me because I'm not mad all the time and I really want to yell at somebody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but I'm not going to because I don't need to. And right. it took it what, it probably back. a couple of months before not feeling that way became my new normal. Right, right. And they've shown in PET scans, let me see if I can do this in pink. Okay, so this little area here is called the anterior cingulate. I've talked about it in other broadcasts. Lots of times when there's anger, it's because there's a disconnect between what we think should be happening and what is happening, and that is seen in depression. And the anger actually deals with a certain part of the anterior cingulate that lights up, and we get really, you know, it's like we go over the edge, as Kathy said. I'm well, sure mine was on fire. <laughs> it wasn't just lit up. Well, a lot of that deals with how this, this basal structure in the brain, the fear center, connects to that area. So we go into that heightened physiologic state very quickly and very easily. But if you have the right serotonin because your MTHFR is being taken care of and dopamine, then that anger insulting event is not as profound. And what I'll also say, I mean, there's a time and place for all this. So certainly some patients need medications. But what Kathy and I are saying is that what can we do naturally, which a lot of people prefer to go the natural route because they're tired, frankly, of the stigma of, well, you, you know, your family's nuts or, you know, you're just crazy, you need to take your meds, you have a chemical problem. There's a lot of pejorative connotation around these issues. And the literature is overflowing that a lot of natural strategies may be employed earlier in life to help people so they never get to that point. Or once they get to that point, we can do things naturally that will actually help. I mean, there's new information coming out on Uh, amino acid derivatives that are helping patients with schizophrenia in the negative symptom phase. These are completely natural supplements. We talked about gluten, how gluten, a gluten-free diet for the 30% of schizophrenics who have gluten antibodies can reduce the symptoms in the negative phase of the illness. I mean, that's pretty wild, but it's out there. It's throughout the literature. So I think we'll wrap up, Kathy, just real quick with the CERT polymorphism. So basically, If this is a brain cell, and this is a brain cell, and we have a bunch of serotonin out here that was released, think of it, as Dr. Sapolsky will say, think of it as a water balloon that went this way, and it dumped out all this serotonin out here. So now we have all this serotonin out here, and we want to get that serotonin back into this neuron, this brain cell. Well, you're going to have these transport proteins that bring serotonin back in. And if you've known somebody with depression who's been taking something like Prozac or something like, you know, citalopram, and they're not responding, it may be because they have a polymorphism for this transmembrane protein. So the way it's done right now, most commonly is, you know, people see their doctor and they get a med and they say, okay, see how it works after a month. Well, again, with this genetic testing, some doctors are now saying, oh, well, we see you're probably not going to respond to that med, so why don't we try a different class of medication? Again, naturally, we look at this with supplements. Um, And certainly, the serotonin transport protein polymorphism can be a part of depression for some people. So, and we're hitting about 8 o'clock now, Kathy, so I think... Yeah, yeah, we are, but you gave us a lot of really good information this morning. I think it gives us a lot more clarity into this depression and anxiety field. Okay, cool. Awesome. Awesome. I hope it was helpful. And thank you, Kathy, as always. And we'll see you guys next week.